this will, I'm so sorry, let's start again. The Defense Department released a report that is not withholding the $1 billion funding from Afghan forces, which Mike Pompeo voted in March that it's going to cut immediately. Uh, what's your thoughts about it? Well, that funding is much needed by Afghanistan, so that was obviously a welcome report. Yeah, and there was another report also by State Department uh, to U.S. Congress, and it's initiating that Pakistan supports uh, Taliban, and uh, still they're harboring uh, groups like Taliban and Haqqani Network. Um, what's your thoughts? Do you think, has this U.S. done enough to push Pakistan to stop uh, harboring these terrorist groups? Well, this has long been a challenge. Uh, this was something that I identified for myself all the way back in late 2005 when Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld asked me to go home from my second tour in Iraq through Afghanistan to assess the situation there, especially with the training equip program. And when I laid out for him in the very first slide uh, that Afghanistan does not equal Iraq, all the different areas in which there were major differences, of course, the two countries could not be more different, in fact. One of those differences, obviously, is the fact that the enemies of mm -hmm. Afghanistan, uh, and there are numerous ones, as you know, it's not just the Afghan Taliban, it's also Al-Qaeda, it's the Haqqani Network, it's the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, it's the Tariqi Taliban Pakistani, and there are others, and now the Islamic State as well, uh, that these have sanctuaries either in the federally administered tribal areas of the mountainous part of Western Pakistan, or uh, in Baluchistan province, the southwest part of that country. I mean, there is a reason that the leadership of the Afghan Taliban is call, called the Quetta Shura. It is because they are located in the vicinity of Quetta, the capital of Baluchistan province. Um, there have been numerous efforts over the years to persuade Pakistan to take a more active effort uh, to eliminate these sanctuaries, these headquarters, these locations to which the enemies can retreat when they're under enormous pressure in Afghanistan, as they were, for example, when I was privileged to be the commander there, 2010, 2011. Uh, there have been some measures taken at various times. Uh, there have been actions pursued, but obviously it has never been enough. I'm sure you followed the news about recent attacks and uh, it prompted President Ghani to change the role of army with offensive attacks against Taliban. Do you think the peace can be achieved if the two sides are in war? Well, I think it's very, very difficult. And I think very understandable that he did uh, what it is that he decided to do. Uh, those yeah. particular attacks were particularly uh, barbaric. Uh, as you'll recall, one of those included an attack on a maternity hospital uh, where mothers and children uh, were killed, babies uh, just born. Uh, and again, I think whomever it was that did that attack, whether it was uh, the Islamic State or uh, Haqqani Network or mm -hmm. Taliban, I, I believe claimed it was not their doing. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, uh, all of these groups have some kind of loose confederation. Uh, and uh, I think they left the president no option but to go back on the offensive. Uh, he cannot allow this kind of attack to take place again. Um, it is an enormous challenge uh, for the conduct of just normal business. And, and again, if people can't even give birth without fearing violence like that, uh, again, the president, I think, had to take the action that he did. The Taliban never stopped the violence. I mean, after the signing the peace agreement from February 29, of course, they, there was no mention of ceasefire, but they never stopped violence. At the same time, what, what is your thoughts about U.S. defense strategy and also support to Afghan forces when it comes to fight uh, Taliban violence? Well, as you may recall, the Taliban in the agreement uh, said that they would stop the violence. And clearly, their definition of violence and I think our definition of violence seem to be at some odds. Uh, because clearly they are still carrying out violent actions. They may not be against Americans, but of course they haven't been against Americans for quite some time because it is the Afghan security forces that are on the front lines and have been now for a number of years as American and coalition forces provide so-called enablers, the 
uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, the precision air attack assets, a variety of other means to help our Afghan partners who are doing the fighting and, and, and often the dying on the front lines. So very clearly the, the intent, I think, behind the American agreement uh, to this was that violence overall would be dramatically reduced, and that does not appear to be the case. In fact, um, third parties have judged that the violence against civilians in particular is at a very significant uh, high level and is very concerning. Um, and again, keep in mind that the Taliban, again, however the relationship may be with other groups, and there is some relationship, but they clearly can't speak for the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan or the Islamic State or Al Qaeda uh, or the TTP or even the Haqqani Taliban, as they are termed, who have some, again, confederation, uh, but do not seem to be able to tell them what to do. So I, I fear that this has exposed uh, one of the weaknesses of this agreement and noting that no one would like to see a peace agreement more than a former soldier who knows the price of the kind of violence that is ongoing, um, who has seen the sacrifice required by uh, Afghan and coalition and American security forces. Um, but I have harbored reservations about the agreement uh, from the very beginning. You may recall uh, pieces that I have written that have been in Foreign Affairs and the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal pointing out uh, what could be shortcomings and now appear to be uh, verified or validated the concerns that I raised. Um, also, you, you mentioned yourself uh, in one part for President Trump. And President Trump this week tweeted and mentioned that he never has been in Afghanistan for winning the war, and they're acting uh, U.S. forces like police in, in Afghanistan. How do you see his assessment of war in Afghanistan? Well, I didn't. I, I must confess, I didn't read that entire statement. Um, and in fact, I haven't actually served under President Trump. I have had conversation with him and certainly do uh, have conversations with those in the State Department and the Pentagon and, and in the White House. But um, I refuse to use the word win or lose, actually, uh, certainly win uh, in Afghanistan, because I didn't want to convey a sense that this is a traditional kind of war or a combat where you can take the flag or where you can take the hill, plant the flag, and go home to a victory parade. Um, rather, I, I felt that this is the kind of war that requires a very sustained commitment. Um, clearly, that commitment has to be sustainable in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure, and not just ours, but also our coalition and Afghan partners. But that again, you had to show this enemy that you are willing to stay for a very long time, uh, recall the Taliban uh, comments supposedly that we may have the watches, but they have the time. And, and again, you have to demonstrate that level of determination and commitment. And then and only then do I think you could actually presume to get an agreement that might be acceptable. Um, instead, multiple administrations have shown a reluctance to put all the forces that were needed uh, early on, uh, then to sustain the increased level of forces a bit later on, uh, and now to sustain what is really quite a modest level of forces. This will be below 9,000 American men and women in uniform when the current drawdown mm -hmm. is complete, which is still a number that can do a tremendous amount to enable, to help, to assist, to advise, to mentor, to train and equip our Afghan partners together with presumably several thousand uh, other coalition forces as well. Um, and the last question, also the State De uh, Defense Department and Inspector General released a report on NATO Special Forces on Freedom Sentinel and also NATO Special Forces, the operation, they are trying to dissolve about 18,000 Afghan forces um, which is uh, part of one program that instrumented by yourself, uh, ALP. 
do you see this as a concern? And, and also they're claiming that the funding is running out by September 20. At the same time, they're saying these Afghan ALP, some of them turning to be insurgents and they have no option left. Uh, what's your thoughts about this? If something like this happened and they're trying to dissolve at least 18,000 ALP? Well, it's probably worth reviewing why it was that we felt that the Afghan local police program was necessary uh, in the beginning, uh, this being in late summer of 2010, when that program was initiated. Uh, and it was essentially uh, intended to uh, extend the presence of government controlled security forces to areas where we did not believe we could have a presence otherwise because we knew how many forces we were going to get as you'll recall we we got the final u.s augmentation by the end of 2010 we could project what that number was going to be and we knew that we were going to have to start drawing those forces down the next summer uh, to at some level not a large number but again there would be no more and that would then uh, mark the beginning of the withdrawal of the 30,000 additional u.s forces that were provided so again, we could do the math. Um, we could do the troop to task ratio, if you will, looking at the country. And it was very clear that we needed to have an additional element developed that ideally would be local in nature and therefore supported by the local leaders, by the tribal uh, elders and so forth, but would also be under the supervision of the provincial ministry of interior yeah leadership and of U.S. Special Forces elements. Uh, and it did indeed serve the function that we needed it to do. Uh, it did expand the presence of the government. Uh, it very much took areas away from uh, either control by the Taliban or the other insurgent elements in Afghanistan um, or areas that were contested. So it improved the security uh, envelope in which normal commerce and activities of citizens and businesses and all the rest of that could could prosper. Always there was a concern that if not supervised, uh, that local forces like this uh, could start to become uh, militia or uh, some kind of local vigilante force. Uh, and this is why we always had, at a minimum, a special forces team or a special forces element augmented by conventional forces that was indeed providing that kind of supervision. And also, uh, this force was linked to the district and the province and ultimately to Kabul through the Ministry of Interior chain of command. Uh, and I fear that in recent years, as the coalition U.S. presence has had to be reduced so significantly, that maintaining that kind of oversight from the U.S. and coalition has proved not possible. And in the meantime, uh, that the Ministry of Interior supervision has also been challenged because of the extent of the coverage of these forces. And of course, the Ministry of Interior doesn't have the kind of helicopters and tactical satellite radios and all the other command and control and transportation and so forth means that we were able to provide uh, during our period supervising these forces. So in some ways, this has borne out what were always reservations about this kind of element. Uh, and again, we've seen this in other wars as well. Um, and ideally, we would have, have folded them into a Ministry of Interior chain of command uh, much sooner than this. Uh, but clearly that is going to have to be done now. And the problem, of course, is that if you cut off funding to individuals who have weapons, who have some training, who have some experience in security operations, if they're not still part of the government force, uh, the fear is that they will go to the other side because they are going to say they have to feed their families and if they're no longer being provided a salary by the government, uh, then they may have to go look elsewhere. Uh, for that. So again, that explains why we felt we had to initiate the Afghan local police program very early on. Um, it explains really the concerns that we had from the very beginning. I remember sitting with President Karzai um, and acknowledging these concerns. This is a program he had wanted to start three or four years earlier, 
the coalition said, no, you shouldn't do that. They always become uh, mm -hmm. out of control. He and I sat down, determined how we could keep them under control. But now that obviously is, is very difficult to do. Uh, and so this will be yet another challenge for Afghanistan at a time when it has plenty of other challenges. Although I might note, of course, that it has been heartening in the last week to see uh, President Ashraf Ghani and Dr. Abdullah Abdullah reach uh, an agreement uh, for a coalition government, again, a government of unity, if you will, uh, although all the duties and responsibilities of, of uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah are not fully determined as far as I can tell. Uh, but that is encouraging. Uh, and it's very important for Afghanistan, which has enough enemies uh, trying to uh, defeat it, that it doesn't need some that are actually inside. Uh, everyone needs to unite. Everyone needs to come together to oppose what have been revealed to be truly barbaric uh, and uh, inhuman uh, enemies, uh, particularly with the attacks that have taken place in recent weeks. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciated your time and talking to a general. Thank you so much. Let me